Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Hello and welcome to Just Branding. Today we have Uli Applebaum with us and he is an award-winning marketing and brand strategy consultant. He's got more than 20 years experience creating brand strategies and building brands. He's held senior roles at some of the largest ad agencies in the world, including BBDO, Leo Burnett and Sapient Nitro. In 2014, he founded the boutique brand strategy shop, first the trousers and then the shoes. I want to understand what that's all about. Um, Uli's also released a book titled The Brand Positioning Workbook, a simple how-to guide to more compelling brand positionings faster, which is exactly what we'll be discussing today. So he's also a blogger for top tier publications, a contributor to various trade publications and a regular podcast interviewee and speaker and much more. So listen in as you're going to be learning much more about brand position. So welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for not uh, mispronunciation for pronunciating my name. Appreciate that. <laughs> ah, I thought I butchered it. <laughs> the we, can't of promise, Julie, we cannot promise that it will continue in, in such a successful vein, but we'll, we'll do our best. The intro, the intro did it. That's enough for me. You can butcher it completely as you want. Now I'm fine with that. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're here to talk about brand positioning and you have a book on it. So like, how did you mm-hmm. come around you know, to writing a book just on that? topic well i shouldn't say just it's a pretty huge topic well it's a it's a long labor of love Uh, to be honest the idea behind the book i literally had 20 plus years ago um and and i literally had it i I was working at the time at uh, i think leo Burnett in uh, in europe in eastern europe and in germany and i just realized this but understood there are these patterns um you know when you look at case studies and brand around around different categories or different geography you know where uh, one brand would, for example, use a, a country of origin platform to differentiate itself in the market, you know, or another one would use a specific ingredient. Um, and uh, so I realized this 20 or so years ago and started to collect case studies and, you know, life takes over. You have children, you move job, you move continent, you know, you do all these kind of things you're supposed to do as an adult. And then um, pre-pandemic, the idea came back to me, you know, and I just thought, my God, the idea is still as good as I always thought it is. Uh, now it's time to write the book. So I finally decided to put it on paper. I used it as a consulting tool and a workshop tool for literally 10, 15 years. I've never really captured it in, in one document, which I did now with this book. So that's really how it came about based on, I call it a a marketing insight, you know, these these patterns you see across categories, across brands, um, asking yourself, how many of these patterns can I identify? And what can I do with those patterns when I have identified them? And that's really what the foundation of this book is, basically. Brilliant. So it, it goes into the nitty gritty of how to actually do it, uh, you know, methodologies and you know, exercises. Is that right? Correct. That's really right. And one, one of the biggest compliment I get from the book is really the it's a no book so it's not Uli's philosophy on branding 5.0 you know or <laughs> uh, Uli's philosophy on what brand should be doing it's really a summary of this methodology and 20 years of experience running positioning processes positioning workshop condensed into 100 plus pages so um, um it's it's um uh, a great sort of like that's why I call it a handbook or workbook, not a not just mm. a book. Um, it's really meant to be uh, worked with, crossed, marked, and uh, there are many ideas in there. Many you can discard as a practitioner, but I'm sure I'm almost to the point where I can guarantee that you'll find one or two that's going to help you be smarter in your thinking um, if you if you read it and if you apply it. So Yuli, can I ask a really simple but yeah. basic question? early on so the the workbook about uh brand positioning can you define for our audience what we're talking about what's your definition of a brand's position yeah great question and uh you know how it is right the more experience you get something the simpler your definition becomes right and um i remember a few years ago seeing on slideshare um sort of like a whole presentation of 40 definitions of what a brand position or what brand positioning is and what a brand is i mean you go crazy when you have that right so uh, my definition is very simply it's the sum of the associations you want to create with your offering amongst your core 
um, call it more valuable consumer segment or desired consumer segment. So it's really about identifying the two or three associations that you want to create with your offering that will make you relevant, that will make you stand out, that will create a value perception that people will be willing to pay a premium for your brand. It's really at the end of the day, um, two or three, maximum four associations that you need to define um, and then build through your marketing plan and marketing program. So um, that's really the simplest form um, I found to describe it. And uh, um, what I like about it, it makes it operational because you know it. it you you can ask any conversation with any uh, any entrepreneur can ask this conversation or any designer can ask this conversation when you start a relationship with the client is what is your brand currently associated with? Does it help you? You know, is it differentiating? Um, does it attract the type of consumer you want? Um, followed by what are the association you want to be associated with um, in the future, in the next three to five years? And once you've defined those, then you can determine, is my design bringing this to life? Is my product lineup bringing that to life? Is my price premium bringing that to life? Am I in the right distribution channel to help create these associations? Or am I doing a whole bunch of you know marketing tactics and activities that that dilute basically what I'm trying to achieve, meaning creating these associations. So that's really, I like it because it's simple. That means I can remember it, which is fairly straightforward, but it's also very actionable, um, uh, which which is another aspect um, I like about it as well. So a key word I heard there was relevance, right? Mm -hmm. Making it relevant for the consumer. So mm -hmm. in your book, you mentioned territories. You have 26 different territories. So mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get into all of them, but let's 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 make a little game out of it. Well, not a game, a scenario. Let's say, Uli, <laughs> I want to find the right positioning for my brand. How do you actually? Where do you start? You know, if for our listeners, like if they're going to do this, how can they put it into play? How can they find a, a good position? Yeah. So the the the. The short answer is by going through as many of them as you possibly can and identifying the one that is true to your brand and resonating relevant to consumers. The reality is it sounds like there are 26, it sounds like a lot, but they are organized, right? And they're organized in a way that you guys um, and I have been organizing these elements for for. Um, a long time. It's like, you know, you have a frame of reference, a context. What is the context in which you put your brand? Is it a usage occasion? Is it a competitive environment? Is the frame of reference culture? So that's simply like the context, the set, the stage you set for your brand. And then the second set of, um, of uh, sources of association is, you know, about how do I want to connect with my consumer? Um, is it through a benefit? Is it through a reward? Is my benefit maybe experiential? Uh, do I want to tap into a set of shared values, um, which are all these sort of like proven ways to to position a brand? And the third one is simply call it the reason to believe. Um, you know, it's like what is it? What is specific and unique about your offering that allows you to make that benefit claim in that specific context? Um, um, so when you understand there are these three groups, and you guys are familiar with this group, right? Frame of reference, benefit, and reason to believe. Those are the basic elements um, of a positioning statement, and that's what I like about this methodology as well. I don't reinvent the wheel. I don't. I don't have a silver magic bullet. It's really tried and true. What the methodology does, it simply breaks down your frame of reference. You have like 10 sources of association. Think about them, go through them, um, think about them in the context of your brand and your competitor and see if something interesting comes up. Same with the benefit, right? You see all your competitors are using a very emotional, lofty, um, sort of like high, highly aspirational benefit. Maybe it's time in the category for a brand to go towards a hard-hitting, functional, tangible benefit, or vice versa. So to go against the, the stream, and I just give you the the menu, right? The options of what's at your disposal to um, uh, to define that. And and the third element is simply a, you know help you, the practitioner, look at your brand, the, its origin, who endorses it, what experts say, all these kind of things, just to try to find something interesting to say about it. So really going through it, and it, it's not it's not like a painful exercise. It's often a fun workshop type exercise um, where my belief is the more crazy you go, the better the ideas that come out, you know. Um, so it's it's a it's a playful thing. It's a fun thing um, that then leads to a variety of options 
and then you can decide okay out of these options which are which ones you know are really different from what's it in the category are relevant to what we know consumers are looking for are something we are comfortable embracing and endorsing you know as a point of view uh, positioning etc cetera, etc cetera. so it it sounds rig- it's very rigorous but it's also very fun and very um um a playful way to go through alcohol always helps but not <laughs> during the day not with a highly paying client but um it leads to great results as well. <laughs> On just branding, alcohol is always allowed. Hey, just a quick question. So I've got I've got a serious question for you, Yuli. Like, have you well, here's the thing. So what if you go through all the contexts and you think and, and you and you look at all the options and you come out and you think, do you know what? In if we're looking at this situation seriously and 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 honestly, we're not different. Like we, 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 we seem to be very much the same as a number of other brands in our category, in our space. Like what should a brand do in that situation? That's a great question too. And, and that's a, a good reminder. A positioning is, is basically a reflection of a truth about the brand, right? So you're not creating anything that doesn't exist. It needs to come from the brand itself or from the product or from the company or from the origin of the company. If there isn't anything there, uh, frankly, the best approach is to um, reevaluate your product, you know, um, go to back to your service, um, check what is the offering you have and can you make that offering more, distinctive more relevant more interesting and i mean there are exercises you can do as well in terms of like new product innovation but a a great positioning needs to be rooted in a truth of the brand if there isn't any truth then maybe you don't have a brand then you have a you know a utility or uh you know just a uh just a me too product out there um and then then I, i would try as a consultant to run from that or First, to recommend to change the product because you cannot get your way to success. If it's not deep in the brand, um, you cannot consumers, um, uh, you know, with this type of fluff. What this methodology allows you to do, though, is really to cover way more, to turn around way more stones, to leave more on stones unturned than any other methodology I've seen out there. So if after using these 26 territories, you still don't have a positioning problem, then you have a product problem, um, very clearly. I love that, Yuli. <laughs> I, I think I, everything you've said there, you know, I'm sure Jacob would agree, like we would we would back up 100%. And, and I think uh, 26, I mean, that's probably the most comprehensive we've faced, right, Jacob? We've interviewed a number of minds across the globe who are top uh, you know, top minds in brand. And I don't think anyone has come up with 26 potential options to help differentiate. But here's the thing. If you go through all that and you still face it, I love what you said. Look, you know, you've got a product problem, which kind of, for me, kind of makes brand quite an interesting subject because what it means is in a, in a business, and I don't know what your thoughts are, are on this. And, you know, I, I perhaps coach this in a question for you. Mm-hmm. Say we do go through all the 26 and then in the unlikely event that we find that we can't really differentiate ourselves amongst the competition or, or amongst the category, then it is a product issue in your sense, in your words. Then then I guess it's it's kind of a cross-functional issue then, isn't it? Because is it just product or is it is it wider? Is it is it is it is it product plus marketing plus um you know a number of functions in the business? How do you cope with that kind of situation? Because I'm facing in my work, I don't know what you think, Jacob, but a number of issues where you come across the same issue where truth be told, we're not that different. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? And you've said we've got to innovate, and I agree mm-hmm. with that. But like, mm-hmm. you know, how do you find businesses take that if you ever get in that situation? And and have you got any advice to anyone in that is- in that in that situation? Well, that's a that's a big question. I hope you guys have time. Um, <laughs> we uh, do, we do. Go, go. <laughs> <laughs> Two thoughts to that. The first one is. Um, Yes, and when I say product, I don't just mean the product discipline or the product development group. I mean literally the the the, the reason for being for the organization. If it's to you know to launch, I don't know, a candy, and no one wants the candy because they all think it's the same. What you do, the type of product you do, uh, needs to be 
uh, rethought from sourcing, from distribution, from you know innovation, product composition and texture. Or you got to start from scratch. But you can you can start um, also with the consumer, right? So a couple of years ago, I worked on with this um, uh, with the state lottery here in the United States, and I don't know if you guys know they're like. Um, each each state has a specific state lottery um, that doesn't compete with the state lotteries in the other states. Um, and, you know, they do both like scratch games and then uh, draw games like a Powerball and all these kind of, um, you know, win, win $100 billion type games. And they approached me because um, when you think about their products, it's basically you're just six numbers, right? So you can choose from six numbers. That's the draw games. And from the scratch games, you basically get a little sheet of, you know, little fields that you can scratch. Um, And the variables you have there is the number of fields you can scratch and the visuals in the fields you can scratch. So if you show a bunny or a red sports car or, you know, whatever it is, um, and maybe the amount you can win. So the 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 variable the, 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 that that allow you to provide innovations are very limited and they came to me and said okay can you help us identify the white spaces and the reason we the the, the way we did it was through a segmentation study um, that really reframed the way this organization was looking at their business so there you know we showed them that people yes they play lottery and lottery buy lottery product but we showed them that behind, beyond that is the satisfaction of very specific needs. That if you reframe your category around these needs can lead you to new product ideas. And what I mean with that, for example, is um, you know um, uh, the scratch game, we define them, it's the business of managing the moment. So you buy a ticket, you're at the gas station, and then you keep it in your pocket. And then, you know, you're on a road trip and want to keep the whole family entertained or you're waiting at the dentist and you're bored and, you know, or at the DMV, um, you use the scratch games to um, uh, to keep yourself busy, you know, whereas um, sort of like the draw games, the big Powerball games, that is sort of like uh, in, in the business of mood management. And what I mean with that is, you know, I feel down, I got three three bills. Uh, it's like, I don't know, January 15, I got three bills. I say, shoot, I don't know, I'm going to make it to the end of the of the month. I'm depressed. I need to lift myself up. I'm going to buy a ticket to make me hope, you know, maybe next week I'm going to win $100 million and all my problems are going to be solved. Or, you know, Jacob, you're walking around your city and you see like a seven here, bus number seven comes by me. You know, ooh, here's a 7-Eleven. And oh, my favorite product is seven dollars today. And you think like, oh my god, my lucky number seven is out today. <laughs> um, it puts me on a high. I think it's my. I have a lucky streak. I'm going to buy a ticket to maintain that. So reframing the category is a way to allow you to um, to identify needs and need states that are relevant for your consumers that can then help guide your. Um, product development and your product innovation. So I'm sorry, that was a very long answer to your question, is basically understand the cons- unfulfilled consumer needs in the market out there and try to develop a product that delivers against these needs um, because no one else. Then your chances to succeed and your chances to position your brand better are significantly increased. Now, the one thing I wanted to, to say though as a caveat, um, there is one example I know, which is a case study uh, I came across is the case of um, um, Energizer battery in the in the U.S. Are you all familiar with Energizer or um, uh, Duracell? It's a global competitor, um, yeah. and the story has it that um, Energizer at the time went to um, their agency. I think that was a uh, Goodby Silverstein at the time, and told them, you know, our competitor Duracell owns longevity of battery you need to help us find a different benefit that is going to be equally or more relevant to consumers than longevity. The agency did its own research, talked to consumers, yada, 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 did all that stuff. And they basically came back and said, sorry, dear client, but no one cares about anything but longevity in the battery category. And that makes sense, right? You want your products that run on batteries to last as long as possible. So their solution was to out-execute Duracell uh, around the benefit of long-lasting. So basically, the core association became 
you know, long lasting batteries. And they out executed them by creating the Energizer Bunny. So all of a sudden, here is a creative device, which became a brand association as well. Irrational, right? So you see a little bunny just going through the screen uh, with his little tambourine, um, really taking away from Duracell the association of longevity and clearly connecting it back to um, to uh, Energizer based on this little um, uh, 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 brand asset, call it this way. So this is, for me, one of the few examples where... Um, a, a gen, not a generic, a, a benefit claimed by a competitor was claimed by someone else and owned by someone else. But I'm reluctant to share that because uh, uh, you don't want to fall into the trap where you say, you know, we couldn't really find anything distinctive about our brand and how to position it. We're going to delegate the responsibility to the creative team. Good luck trying to differentiate <laughs> our brand because we couldn't we really couldn't find anything. And that is lame. And that is lazy. So, uh, we got to use that example, you know, don't walk around saying, yeah, but Energizer did it, so you can do it too, right? <laughs> Find a creative solution that really saves our business. Yeah, that's not Super that's not how it works. Yeah. So so if I was to say to you then, um, what 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 would have worked? What would, in, in your experience, what's, what's a better approach? Um, would it, it, I guess it would be going back to the product, get back to the, the process, figuring out what's valuable to the customer, like you said originally, and, and reinventing the proposition genuinely and authentically around something that's really impactful and meaningful. Is that, would, would you agree with that? That would definitely be a way to do it. You build basically an offering based on a need that you see in the market that is unfulfilled and you design your product or create it, whatever you want to call it, you build your product around that specific need. Absolutely. Um, that's definitely um, a way to go. The other way to, to go, um, and that comes back to one of these 26 territories, is to shift your competitive space and find a, a, a substitute category in which your product looks better than its original category. Um, and what I mean with that is, for example, imagine you have a fruit drink, right? A typical example is where you have a fruit juice, but you only have like 5% fruit content, right? And all your competitors out there have 80% fruit content. They're fully organic, um, you know, uh, from pristine fields, you know, sunny uh, hills, et cetera, et cetera. And you just have like, I don't know, let's say 5 or 10% fruit juice. It's kind of hard to compete in terms of, you know, we are the better juice than all these uh, normal ones. But you can look maybe for another beverage category and try to see, can I compete against those? So, for example, you could look at the soda category and you could say, okay, they have 90% sugar. I only have, uh, you know, 40% sugar, but I have 20% or 10% fruits compared to a soda. I am a more attractive alternative or healthier alternative than compared to an organic fruit juice. So by shifting the category or looking for substitute categories, um, you can try to see, does this shed a better light on my offering than my core competitors out there? So that might be a way to do it as well. But the proper way to do it would be go and develop a product that satisfies customer need. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing all those those examples. I, I think we're dancing around the the classic three C's here with the the company and the category and the consumer. Two hundred percent. Yeah. So, like finding that sweet spot in the middle, I, I I always think about that. So, there's always those three areas that you can look to mm -hmm. figure out. You know, what is a position that we could hold? You know, that is absolutely true. And that is, and and you guys have seen the book. None of these twenty six territories is magic, or you know, coming from space, or you know, based on the latest research on neuros, not neuropsychology or anything like that. Those are tried and true methods that I'm sure as you go through them, every single one of them will be familiar to you and you probably will have used them in your own work uh, during your career at one stage or another. What's unique about it is it packages them in one offering and allows you to go through all of them at once, basically. Yeah, I love how it's a workbook, and you've uh, you've specifically said that it's a workbook with the title, and right? it's mm -hmm. very actionable. You can take it away because you can often get these big brand bibles that like there's there's so many elements of brand, and it can be yes. overwhelming. But you know, you narrow in on you know what 
you could consider as the most important part of a, a brand is the position because yeah. that's going to, yeah. you know, dictate everything else to come. So, you know, yeah. it's great that you, you know, have a, a book on that now. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, the funny thing is when I decided to write the book, I first checked on Amazon, of course, and looked at the what are the books I admire and how many books are there about brand positioning. And I came up when I wrote it with end of last year, mid, mid of last year, Amazon listed 262 books about brand positioning. Um, so that you scratch your head, right? And you're like, okay, do mm. I really need to write 263? Do I have something to <laughs> offer that these 262 others haven't done? But the reality is, and I don't want to diss uh, this other authors um, because it's a labor of love to write a book. Uh, but a lot of them is, you know, just a rehash or reinterpretation of existing knowledge or applying, you know, brand positioning to personal brand building. So it's really just a lot of rehashing um, as opposed to really providing a, a methodology, a guide, a how-to guide on that, that really can guide everyone step by step through the whole process. So I decided, you know what? Um, I'm going to write it anyway and see if I can find this niche. And that's why I also call it the workbook too. To differentiate myself a little bit, we just talked about this. It's not book about brand positioning number 263. It's a workbook on brand positioning number one. So um, uh, creating my own subcategory here. We love it. We love it. <laughs> so so I was, I was going to ask for like whether or not you could give our listeners a bit of a flavor. So, so let, let's say, for example... We buy a, we buy the book. We are we, we're looking at our business or a, a client that we're working with. Um, what can we expect to go through in the workbook? Can you give us any kind of? I know there's 26 as you mentioned, kind of, kind of 26 options. But give us a flavor of what that starts to look like, and and time and process and that kind of stuff, so that we can get a bit of a feel for 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 the workbook itself. Absolutely. So let's say you take the book. And read it or, or you know, have read it over the weekend and have a conversation with your client on Monday. What this book is going to give you, and, and the assignment is about positioning, finding sort of like what is what is unique about my brand? How do I need to position it? How do I make it stand out? What this book is going to give you from the get-go is way more options at your disposal than you would be able to come up with on your own. And I'm sure you're a brilliant strategist, so I'm really not, not, not against your qualification and your skills. The point is simply, my experience is most people, you know, will be able to come up with six, seven, eight ways to, to position a brand based on their experience, based on their training, based on their own success stories, but no one will be able to come up with, um, um, 26 of those. So the potential pool of options you can choose from will be significantly increased from the get-go. Um, now, if you're the type of person or if a reader is a type of person who say, oh, my method works, you know, I always do cultural branding or I always do functional product benefits and that's the one I focus on. So if you like narrow your mindset, um, the book is not going to help you because it really allows you to explore a very wide and diverse range of options simply by answering each each territory in this book each source of brand association has a couple of questions that stimulate your thinking um, and you'll be able to come up with way more potential options for your client than without and because you have i don't know 60 options as opposed to only 15 options the likelihood that one of these 60 it's going to be novel, innovative, different from what's being done in the category is significantly higher than um, um, uh, without it. So from the get-go, it's going to give you an, an option. It can also help you, and, and a couple of uh, people reach out to me to mention that to me, it's like, you have a big presentation tomorrow. The client wants to know how would you work? How can you position the brand? You are stuck. You're mentally stuck. You're sitting in front of your sheet of paper or you have absorbed too much information. Don't know what to do with it. You feel like you have a block. Um, what this book allows you to do by going through these territories, it's, it unlocks it basically. It gives you, hey, here's another way to think about it. Doesn't work for you. Here's another way to think about it. Doesn't work for you either. How about number 15, the way to think about it? So I've yet to find someone who read the book and said, you know what? I still had no idea coming out of reading that book on what to do for my brands. Um, so it, it, what it does, it really accelerates and guides your I call it, if you want to be technical, your hypothesis generating uh, process, you know, and that's what you do when you position a brand. You look at the options at your disposal and what this thing does, it gives you 
I don't know, five, six, seven times more option than you would without the book. And um, I've used this literally in the course of, you know, 24 hour turnaround. Um, and uh, from a from a, a discussion point of view with your client, it's very um, easy to show them, hey, here are seven ways to position your brand. They're all relevant. They're all interesting. Shouldn't we do some research to try to understand which one is the most relevant? You know, um, and it's not just fluff ideas. It's very solid, ro robust ideas. And I'm using this in five month consulting projects that include everything from you know qualitative research, quantitative research, workshops, stakeholder interviews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, and that really sort of like uh, encompasses a much more, a much broader scope. So it's really, and people have used it to, you know, to put their um, coffee mug on, on the desk to avoid staying in the <laughs> desk. So it's really a functional, multifunctional uh, tool. If anyone does that, by the way, you should be shot because uh, <laughs> it's clearly more valuable than that. No, it sounds amazing. And, and I think for me, as a strategist, you know, I've, I've literally put an order in um, to, to, to get this book because it, it, it's it. you need those prompts for you as a strategist. You need those prompts to kind of um, excite your mind, to kind of prompt you to, to explore new areas. And 26 is huge. Yeah. But like the way you've described it to me is kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's invaluable in that sense, a, wor a workbook that will help you work through those those twenty like six areas for positioning. Yeah, a cheat thing, a cheat sheet. But 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 also yeah. everything you've said to me ground is grounded in reality. You know, mm -hmm. and as you rightly said, you know, any one of these, and I'm sure you'd agree with this. And feel free to disagree if you, if you don't. If you don't, but you, you, you'd want to kind of check it, wouldn't you? Like by by looking at customer insights, by discussing things with customers, with 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 you know, in the market yeah. to make sure that the positioning is going to be effective going forwards. Yeah. But you still have to have that idea, that spark yeah. in the first place. And yeah. you still have to align and rally the team, the leadership team behind it yeah. into this potential new future. Yeah. So, you know, we need those sorts of things. So, you know, so thank you for producing the book, I would no, say. You know, thank you for amazing. having me and having me talk about it. I appreciate it. One one final thing uh, before yeah. we, we go. So, what what would be the key thing that you want readers to take away from the book? What I want them to take away is that positioning is not rocket science. Um, I mean, it, it's a craft, right? And just like any craft, the more you practice, the better you get at. But like any craft, you need a tool. You know, you need to learn how a tool works. You need to learn how, you know, if you're painting, you need to know how paint, you know, uh, uh, sticks on uh, certain canvases and stuff. So you need to learn these basics. Um, and um, um, so it's really not rocket science. Everyone can be a, a great strategist in terms of able to develop brand positioning. And one thing that completely drives me nuts, which which is one of the reasons I wrote this book, is the superficiality of the current thinking in the industry, right? We're always running after the newest shining object. Now, I, I swear to God, if someone comes to me and asks, how does positioning change in the metaverse? I'm going to slap that person. You know, I'm going to get physical. But you, you, you see this. Slap Jacob because he loves the metaverse. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm getting into the metaverse. I'm going to right at the end. Keep, keep no. going. Keep going. Why, why would you say such a thing? <laughs> Nothing against the metaverse, but the point is, <laughs> I, I don't want to. I, I think the best strategies or the best positionings are not the one that follow a belief system. So if you you start a project thinking like, you know, I'm selling a chemical uh, fertilizer um, that's going to, you know, be transferred into food product, but I would like to develop a brand purpose for my, for my, for my, my chemical. No, you don't, you know, or everyone wants to be relevant culturally. So cultural branding is, is, um, is, a. Uh, uh, a big trend we've seen over the last 10 years. And nothing wrong, brand purpose, cultural branding have their place with the right brand in the right context for the right consumer segment. But going from the get-go and saying, your solution is going to be a purpose. Well, but, uh, you know, my chemicals, I don't want to talk about them because they're illegal in half the states. Uh, you know, it's the wrong approach. What I want to show you is there is way more richness in positioning a brand beyond these sort of like superficial 
um, mainstream beliefs um, that really, and that's for me the key to success, right? Is not have I positioned a brand successfully around the purpose or did I do some, do some great cultural branding? No. Did I carve out a unique position that is relevant to a consumer segment that gets my client's brand to grow? That is my benchmark. Um, so really, uh, there is a richness in the book that allows you to go beyond the superficial thinking. Now, if you guys, sorry, I listened to some of your podcasts, but I, I, I didn't see the section that say we only do brand purpose. Um, if that's sort of like your motto, the book might not be that much for you. Or if that's your mindset, the book might not be for you because it gives you way more options um, to position a brand in a relevant fashion. So uh, that's my little crusade against the superficial thinking in the industry. <laughs> I stop my rent now. I stop my rent. No, nice, nice. And, and we, we, we appreciate it. I think Jacob and I were both um, would both agree that you've got to go beyond the superficial. You've got to go beyond the kind of the, 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 the surface. The, the surface, yeah. And and I agree with that. And and I think for me, what you've said and and rightly highlighted throughout all this conversation is it's got to be authentic, right? It's got to yeah. be relevant. It's got to be yeah. actual. And I mean, final question for me. And I know Jacob's probably got a couple of follow ups, but. What do you do in your consulting work when you face leadership teams that that are superficial, that are just kind of like trying to greenwash something or purpose wash something? How do you personally deal with that? You know, particularly after maybe you've taken a gig or or accepted a, a project. How do you deal with that? It's just a genuine question from me. Well, you you lose a lot of hair for one. That's number one. Um, oh, wow! J just for the least listeners who's uh, who's not on video, he just took his cap off, and we've just realized there is no hair. I have a um, cut. Yep. Smash, but there we are. Carry on. Keep going. <laughs> no, um, it's a great question though, and that that's a whole other part. But that that taps more for me in the consulting gigs um, on how to manage a consulting assignment. Um, and in my case, I always start them with, you know, stakeholder interviews, understand what are the internals, what are the real ambitions of the company? You know, are there a couple of people that maybe do not want the change or do not want to posit to a change in positioning or something like that? So just try to get a sense for um, um, the sort of like culture and power dynamic and decision making dynamic within the organization. And then when you have that, you determine who am I going to come up these ideas with? So the time, whether it's an online workshop or an in-person workshop, who do I want it to invite in those meetings? And ironically, it's not always the people, all the people who agree with you. You know, you want the people who disagree with you, the people who resist the idea or the change to be part of this process um, to get them involved as well. And then the third is, and the, the book is full of that as well, it's just a bunch of creativity techniques and exercises to get people to get out of their um, shell, basically, you know, to get them to think differently. So one example I regularly use is I once had to moderate um, a two-day workshop in Germany with a group of 12 German engineers. And um, uh, trust me, German engineers, my dad is a German engineer, it's one of the most rigorous and rigid person out there. So there is one way to do things or there is an engineering and scientific way to do things and nothing else. So one of the exercises I typically do or I like to do sometimes is the, you know, um, a negative brainstorm. So instead of thinking about the benefit of your product, think about all the reasons why consumers should um, um, hate your product and then take that knowledge and turn that into a positive, you know, and um, so I asked those guys, so what's wrong with your product? And in anon in anon anonymously, the response was, our product is perfect. It was a <laughs> CT scanners. It was like medical CT scanners. And it was the only thing that is imperfect about our product is the patient. Because when you put the patient in the scanner, you know, and it goes in the scanner and then you have the, the, the rotation, the, the imagery taking place, these silly patients, because they're nervous, tend to move. That is the only problem with our product, a patient moving. So here, a very ingrained uh, mindset of, of engineers trying to, you know, that you're trying to get to think creatively. So all you can do is change the type of exercise, tell dirty jokes, get them to think differently and individually uh, to come up with ideas to try to get them out of their own sort of like mindset and patterns and stuff like that. 
And uh, this was a two-day workshop. I think I, I wrote about it in the book too. After day one, I thought I was fired. You know, I was packing my <laughs> bags already and thinking like, when is the earliest fl uh, flight to the US tomorrow morning? I don't need, we need to show up at the second day. Uh, but then by reorganizing the type of exercises I did with those guys, and frankly, the beginning of the workshop was really, please don't talk to each other. I don't want you to talk, think for yourself, write things down, and then hand over your your ideas to your neighbors, but don't talk to them. I don't want to hear the the patient is the only problem in my product type conversation. Um, and that then led, so um, I don't know, again, a long-winded answer to your question, understanding the politics and the situation in the organization, bringing in the right people to the workshop, and then having this right type of exercises to get people to to really think outside of their own skin. And if you see that after the first day of the workshop, this doesn't work, don't be afraid to change your exercises and change your approach to generating ideas to get the results the second day around. So uh, I could have summarized it in, in this 30 second. I started by summarizing it in 30 well, seconds. It gave us context, but <laughs> you're totally right, right? The, the more you know, the more tools you have in your backpack and you can get them out when you need. And you, know, if you don't know what you don't know. So once yeah. you have you know those 26 methodologies or territories yeah. you you're aware of them you can use them when it, the yeah. time arises or yeah. you know you have a different thinking technique or a different yeah. way of you know asking questions that mindset yeah. i think they're all yeah. brilliant tools to we can yeah. use as strategists so thank Absolutely. you for sharing. thank you thank you all right so we will wrap this up but before we do please let us know where we can get your book where we can connect with you any other last things you you may want to share yeah, so appreciate that. So the book can be literally, that's the beauty of Amazon worldwide, can literally be bought where you can access Amazon. And I think um, in more and more countries, what, I, what I, I'm really blown away by is you can literally print the book. So if you're in India, you can print a paper paperback version or a hard copy version, whether now, you're in Germany. <laughs> that would be great US. in Australia because the postage <laughs> to Australia is ridiculous. I think you might be able to already in Australia. I'm not 100% sure, but you might be. Um, in the worst case, you get the Kindle version all over the world. Um, and the best way to reach out to me is uh, on LinkedIn, Uli Applebaum. Uh, just to you know, send me a connect connection invite. Don't send me a, a sales pitch on the new uh, magical CRM tool that you have developed that is going to get me 20 clients a month. Um, those I tend not to respond to, but very open to always uh, respond <laughs> to connection requests. Um, and and um, worst case, you can also find me uh, uh, on my website, which is firstthetrousers.com. So first minus D oh, minus We didn't get into that. I, I really want to know and, what uh, <laughs> where this name came from. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we okay. We can't close. We cannot close without an understanding of where minus the trousers minus goes <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> tell us, tell us about that. That's such a cool well, it's really simple. So I, I brainstormed with a friend of mine. He was a creative director on names when I decided to start my business. And I didn't want to call it Applebaum Consulting or, you know, Stellar Brand Consulting or something like that. Um, so the more we drank, the more crazy our ideas became. Um, <laughs> And um, uh, eventually we came up with names like first the trousers, then the shoes. And so the next morning I, I woke up with a headache and looked at my list and this name stuck with me. And the name is actually also 20 plus years old because before I moved to the US, I had this company entity already. Um, and it always resonated with me. And the weird thing is a few years later, I understood why, because um, I'm a strategy. So I believe strategy comes first. Um, but I also believe that strategy is a creative ideation process or creative solving, solving problem uh, process. So creativity is embedded in the strategic process. So uh, uh, first the trousers, then the shoes was a way to express that, um, to say, you know, we do strategy, but we do it creatively. And then the last thing is I'm a con contrarian. And at the time when I was coming up with names for the company, the, the rule was like, keep it really short. It needs to be a very, very short name. And I was like, that. I'm going to have a long name. <laughs> it's going to be first the trousers, then the shoes. And, uh, you know, people, as long as it creates an image in your brain, and as long as you remember something like first the, you know, shorts, then the flip-flops, or, you know, first the whatever, it's what works with me. As That's the Australian you version. If you opened up down here, <laughs> that's right. In Australia, just flip flops. So I like that. Nice. Uh, thank you. It's very, very memorable, and you know, it perked our interest. So here we are talking about it. So it's definitely right. done its job.
And yeah, it, it used to to have follow up. You know, you reach out to potential clients and follow up and said, "Yes, I this will happen. I sent you something. You know, a couple of days ago." It's like, "No, who? What? No, I don't remember." He was like, "Yes, yeah, first the trousers. Oh, the trousers. Yes, no, I do remember <laughs> what you sent me. Yes, so very memorable, much more than my weird name. So um, uh, it was, worked well for me. Cool, mate. cool word, <laughs> isn't it? Trousers. It just is so weird. It's such an unusual <laughs> word." Love yes. it. Brilliant. That's when when yeah, two Germans ideate English names. That's when you come up with trousers <laughs> as opposed to pants or whatever whatever else you may come up with. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thanks so much. And listen, thanks so much for coming on, sharing your wisdom, sharing the experience that you've got, and 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 you know a, an overview of the twenty six territories, folks. Listen up, right? You don't want to position a brand. You want to get this book. It's going to help you to understand you know, the options available to you. I, I, you know, I, I don't think, as I said before, I don't think Jacob and I, we interview guests across the world, the best minds in the business. I don't think anyone's kind of articulated 26 before. So, you know, get this book, have it, explore it, think about it and use it in your work. So I want to say thank you to you, Yuri, for coming on, for exploring this with us and for, for the banter. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. I had a great time talking to you guys. Really appreciate that. And uh, you butched my name at the end, but that's okay. I was expecting that. So, um, um... Oh, so, so far, <laughs> oh, oh I'm like the worst of Pazzi Germany. So, so we nearly I'm, got through it, Matt. Nearly. I nearly got it right. I had one more minute to go. Oh, so, so correct me, Jacob. Just teasing. <laughs> Right. Uli, Uli. Uli. That's, uh, that's Uli, not Uli. That's, Uli. I'm just Come on. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, Uli, let me, let me thank you properly. Uli, thank you. Appreciate it. No, thank you guys. Really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much.